A very good evening to you all and welcome to the English News Bulletin here on RAN Television. We suppose that you had a restful weekend and you started the week well. Now our top stories. Alice Weirimun Deritu, the Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide at the United Nations, affirms that the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda left no lessons to the international community. The Ministry of Health has reported that among the 49 individuals who have recovered from the Marburg, some have completed the surveillance program after testing negative for the virus. On the international scene, voters in the United States cast ballots Tuesday to choose their next president. Political polls show candidates Donald Trump and Kamala Harris in a close race. My name is Olive Nitin, so it's a pleasure to have you with us. Now let's take a look at the news in details. The Ministry of Health has reported that among the 49 individuals who have recovered from the Marburg virus, some have completed the surveillance program after testing negative for the virus even in areas where it can persist in the body for an extended period. However, the Ministry urges the public not to be complacent as the virus is still active. We have more with Enora Gladys. The Ministry of Health reports that there have been no deaths from Marburg disease in the past month. Currently, there are 66 confirmed Marburg patients. 15 have died, 14 have recovered, and two are being treated in good health, with no one in intensive care. The Minister of Health, Dr. Saben Sanzimana, emphasizes that the public should not become complacent, as the virus is highly contagious and can severely impact those who contract it. Overall, the case fatality rate is 22.7%. Uh, you remember when this outbreak started, the first thing everyone was talking about is 90% case fatality rate. The probability of dying from this virus is 90%. From previous outbreaks, really has been quite high. But uh, this case fatality rate of 22.7% in our context is, uh, I mean, I would say good news, although these are people we we lost, but it could have been worse, uh, even, even with the best care we had, even with the tools we had, could have been. Uh, we also appreciate everyone's contribution to uh, reduce the mortality of this, of this, of this disease. Um, so that is a highlight. Um, and, and again, the two cases I mentioned of those who got extubated is another um, confirmation that these two people could have uh, died if extra efforts and uh, uh, the most advanced critical care hadn't been applied. Minister Sanzimana also explains that there are ongoing activities to monitor those who have recovered from this disease because there are parts of the body where it may not be entirely cleared from the body and could persist for an extended period. He notes that monitoring is essential, since if not done well, it could become a source of its spread. Because this virus is, is very complex, uh, sometimes you, you may see that a uh, small amount of virus can remain uh, hidden in some uh, uh, parts of the body, um, and that it may be different from one, to, uh, one person to another. So we'll keep following these recovered individuals for some time give ourselves a special follow-up. They will be receiving different type of testing, uh, especially uh, we know that, for example, in semen, for men, a virus can remain in semen uh, for several months, uh, even after they have cleared the virus in, in, in their blood. So we keep testing them uh, to make sure that they have recovered completely and there is no uh, even small amount of viruses uh, present, because otherwise they can reactivate and even infect um, or restart the outbreak. So it's very important to mention this to you, that although we have this number of recovered people, uh, we'll keep following up on them uh, for uh, several months. The Ministry of Health has reported that among the 49 individuals who have recovered from Marburg, some have completed the surveillance program after testing negative for the virus, even in areas where it can persist in the body for an extended period. 
The ministry also detailed that the first Marburg case in Rwanda involved a minor who contracted the virus from a bat. He subsequently infected his wife, who tragically succumbed to the virus. In response, a team of doctors have been deployed to monitor the health of workers daily, and similar measures are being implemented in other mines where bats are present. To mitigate the risk, a wall has been constructed in the mine to separate the working area from bats' habitat. The ministry cautioned against killing bats as they play a vital role in controlling diseases spread by mosquitoes and other insects, as well as being essential for agricultural pollination. So far, 1,700 people in Rwanda have been vaccinated against the Marburg virus. Thank you, Enora, for the detailed report. Now to other matters. Alice Werimu Nderitu, the Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide at the United Nations, affirms that the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda left no lessons to the international community given killings targeting the Tutsi in the Eastern DRC. She made the remarks on Monday in a workshop on the implementation of the Napoli Plan of Action for Women in Communities to send to counter hate speech and prevent incitement to violence that could lead to genocide and related crimes. Prince Manzi with more. Samia El Hashmi from South Sudan elaborates on the difficult situation citizens in her country live in after the instabilities that also claimed the lives of many. The situation there, women are suffering from uh, from not being safe, not being protected, and uh, women really uh, need uh, to be supported in all uh, kind of support, uh, food, uh, security, and uh, they need to be part of any solution. I think women can play a role uh, uh, an important and crucial role in uh, make uh, peace happen in Sudan. Actually, uh, what we want to say, we don't need to repeat what happened in, uh, in Rwanda. We learn from the experiences of, from our, uh, of our uh, brothers uh, and sisters here from, uh, for Rwanda. Fighting is something not make, uh, uh, not building this nation, not building the country. What we want Sudanese people is to build on uh, being just Sudanese without any differences, without any uh, discrimination. The Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide at the United Nations, Alice Wairi Muderintu, reiterates how the UN's analysis of the killings in South Sudan gives a clear image of how the genocide in Rwanda and other genocides were executed. I've been in Sudan before then I went to the refugee camps and their testimonies are very powerful. Testimonies of rape, testimonies of, of killings, testimonies of deliberate targeting of young boys and men. And, and uh, our framework of analysis is itself drafted from the experiences of Rwanda. So if you read it, you will see what Rwanda looked like in 1993 before the genocide uh, against the Tutsi in 1994 or what um, Srebrenica looked like um, in 1994 before the genocide in 1994 or even what Nazi Germany looked like before the Holocaust. So those risk factors, if, if the intention is to exterminate an ethnic group, the ideas are the same. In Germany, in Rwanda, in, in, in the Balkans, the ideas are the same. So you can actually um, put out a list in terms of this is what we are seeing. Based on the situation in Eastern DRC, Alice Wairimu emphasizes that never again should be transformed from words to action. I've been worried about the ideology that has been carried um, to the DRC. Ideology that was carried there after the genocide happened here in 1994 when we had quite a large number of genocidaires moving to DRC and that they, this ideology has been passed on um, from parent to child. When I met them I told them I'm not going to keep quiet about what's happening to you because this office when it was created the Security Council said we are creating the office of the special advisor on the prevention of genocide to avoid a genocide like that happened against the Tutsi in Rwanda, are indicted by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, who are living free lives in many parts of the world, including in the DRC. Yeah, so we must speak to the fact that an ideology 
exists against the Congolese Tutsi. It's an ideology that is fed by what happened to the Tutsi in this country and that we must address it. We can't keep beating around the bush. We keep saying never again. What does never again mean if we cannot speak to the fact that this ideology is alive and well? Freddy Mutangwa, the CEO of IHS Trust, states that this workshop is a platform to demonstrate Rwanda's actions against genocide prevention and denial. Most of the participants are in their hardest times and we learn on how Rwanda was able to overcome its darkest past and how it is on the forefront of development, ensuring accountability and it has a future. Measures of this workshop will be given to country members of the United Nations to adopt policies against hate speeches, conflicts and any other forms leading to genocide. Thank you, Prince. Now to the agricultural sector. Rwanda has invested over 3.5 billion Rwandan francs in the Tekana Urishinjo Muinzi Mworozi Crop and Livestock Insurance Program. And to date, more than 600,000 participants have received compensation for various losses faced in this sector. However, they are requesting that compensation be based on the total loss of production rather than just the initial investment. Sola Sandra with more. Emmanuel Karimana, a professional farmer and livestock keeper from Rwamagana, states that this insurance program has protected them from the losses they previously encountered. A common concern among farmers and livestock keepers is the need for faster compensation processes. We are very happy because in the past, if someone faced losses with their livestock, it was difficult to get help. Now, when we encounter challenges with our livestock, there is compensation available and banks have improved their understanding on our needs. Currently, you can use your livestock as a collateral to obtain loans. In the past, when a farmer suffered a loss, insurance often took a long time to process crimes. This delay made it difficult for us to access the capital needed to return to our fields and resume farming. Alex Sibahizi, the CEO of Bank of Kigali General Insurance Company Limited, mentioned that they are looking into ways to speed up the services they provide to farmer and livestock keepers. But on, on crop side, uh, the cost of investment is what is insured, not the cost of uh, expected production. So what the farmers are saying now, they are arguing the government and the private insurance companies to extend the insurance from the cost of investment to even the expected yield or the expected production. Of course, this will have a bearing on premium paid. If you are paying a premium for the cost of investment and you want the scheme to cover even the expected yield, you would also expect that the premium you pay will increase. But that, that should not be a problem. It is understandable. The government is working on extending uh, the insurance from the cost of production uh, to even cover the yield and expected production. So we hope in the future uh, this worry that the farmers are giving us is going to be understood and settled by government. Currently, the insured crops include rice, maize, potatoes, peppers, cassava, soybeans, beans, and vegetables, while livestock insurance covers cattle, pigs, chicken, and fish. Joseph Musiruka, the program manager for Tekana Urishinjiwe Muhinzi Mworozi, indicates that they are taking steps to address other issues within the program. Uh, we want to put in place a digital platform where those those who are, are in the place to, to do to validate those claims are in the system, even the farmer have access on those platforms so that they can follow all the process. Once there is something missing, the farmer can be notified immediately, complete the document. We have a commitment for insurance company. For them, they are saying in three days they will be paying the claims. But on the side of the government, the, term, the contract we have with the insurance company is 30 days. We want to make sure that at least within 30 days, all the farm 100 percent can be compensated. Not only compensated, having a feedback. If it is a rejection, we have a, a feedback with the tangible uh, reason, the reason for not being compensated. If the farmer have a reason, can repeat immediately. But this platform also help the government institution to do a follow-up 
on timely manner. Since its launch in 2019, the program has supported 5,068 and 563 farmers and 70 and 95,398 livestock keepers. Approximately 9.37 billion Rwandan francs has been invested in these crops and living stock insurance program. Of this amount, 40% has been provided by the government, while the remaining 60% has been contributed by farmers and livestock. Keepers. Saula Sandra Tumkund, TV News. Tomorrow, news in Musanza district at the Rwanda Peace Academy. 30 civilians, police officers, and soldiers are currently participating in training aimed at enhancing their knowledge of international human rights law. This training is designated to help them understand their role in upholding these rights during peacekeeping and peace building missions. The group includes 10 civilians, 10 police officers and 10 soldiers all from Rwanda participating in the four-day training and the training is organized in collaboration with the United Nations Human Rights Office in Rwanda. Senior Human Rights Advisor Michael Ngavirano explained that understanding this law will benefit the participants both in their daily lives and in their responsibilities. Having knowledge of how human rights and international human rights law applies in peace support operations, but also how it applies in day-to-day -day running of your own lives from family to national level is a very good tool. So the information you get the knowledge you get, the tools you get, you use them from the home to the community to the country, but also beyond when you contribute to peacekeeping and peace support. Method Ruzindana, the head of research at the Rwanda Peace Academy, encouraged participants to make good use of this opportunity to share experiences. I will invite participants to take benefit of this important course and discuss it not just as a, an academic exercise, but using appropriately this platform by sharing the experience as to get required knowledge, skills, and behavior in integrated mission where components, including military, police, and civilians operate in complementarity. Rwanda ranks third among countries with the highest number of police officers and soldiers in various United Nations peacekeeping missions worldwide, missions that also rely heavily on civilian contributions. To more news, members of the Somali's Parliamentary Committee on Gender Equality and Human Rights are in Rwanda for a five-day study visit aimed at enhancing their effectiveness and supporting the passage of legislation that better serves their constituents. Adam Squizera with more. The Somalia parliamentarians noted that their country continues to face severe human rights challenges, including ongoing conflicts. They chose Rwanda for this study visit, as it stands as a model for Africa in many areas. Hawa Sokoli Ali, the president of the committee, who is leading this delegation. But it is my first time to come here, so I see more uh, development, more uh, uh, business. Yesterday, I'm I'm still, I'm uh, visiting the supermarket and the market and some area of the uh, country. So I see. Uh, the people is relaxed. The people is uh, peace. The people is uh, the the walking is the uh, road. Uh, I see more people is uh, uh, playing uh, football and something. So uh, I see more uh, development for the uh, country. So that is why I need to come here and uh, to choose uh, Kigali to visit uh, the government to work, how to work the government, and how to work the people, and how they uh, do the examples for the, all the uh, African countries, especially East Africa. Ndanjiza Madina, the chairperson of the Committee on Unity, Human Rights, and Fight Against Genocide in the Parliament of Rwanda, emphasized that Rwanda's experience and the lessons learned from its challenges could offer valuable insights to help Somalia overcome its ongoing issues. 
Um, what we discussed is that uh, in their constitution, as it appears in our constitution, if they could also include uh, the aspect of, uh, of unity of Somalis. As you know, uh, Somali has had um, civil wars uh, for the last three decades. And also what we mentioned is with regard to the empowerment of women, as uh, in our constitution we have a fundamental, in our fundamental uh, provisions we also have um, at least 30% of women uh, in the leadership uh, positions. So they also um, um, say that uh, they're also going to include that provision in their constitution where they'll have to have at least a quarter, 30% uh, of women in, in, their, in, their, um, in their leadership positions. Also other um, uh, special uh, uh, categories like uh, uh, children's rights and also women's rights and also uh, the rights of people with disabilities. So it's going to also feature in their constitution. This delegation is set to spend five days in in Rwanda, during which they were engaged with institutions such as the Office of Ombudsman, the National Commission for Human Rights, as they also visit the Kigali Genocide Memorial. Rwanda and Somalia have good relations in various sectors including air transport, security and others. Adam Squizera, our TV News. Thank you, Adams, for the detailed report now to environmental matters. Residents of Gaye and Wutare sectors in the Sisi district are optimistic about the productivity of the 300,000 tree, um, indigenous and mixed crop trees they have begun planting. These initiatives aim to mitigate soil erosion, a significant challenge in the region. The trees are being provided by the Natural Rwanda Project, which is focused on addressing climate change impacts in these sectors. Prince Manzi with more. Certain areas of the Bgaye and the Butari sectors characterized by steep hills are highly susceptible to erosion, which leads to the loss of crops and other assets for the local population. Additionally, residents have noted that the scarcity of indigenous trees in the region is adversely impacting the ecosystem. Landslides are frequent here because of the steep hills and such hills with no trees often face landslides. In response to these challenges, the Nature Rwanda project is assisting residents of Utari and Geyeye in planting indigenous trees alongside trees that are mixed with crops, as well as fruit trees such as avocados. Jean-Claude Savimana, the executive director, emphasized the project's goals for the region and outlines the expectations for the community's involvement and the long-term benefits of these initiatives. We planted trees on 600 hectares over the past two years, but we've noticed a significant area still in need of reforestation. As a result, we've decided to expand our efforts and we now plant trees on an area of a thousand hectares with the goal of planting 300,000 trees. Trees play a crucial role in sustaining the soil, but their importance goes beyond that. They also enhance agricultural productivity by attracting insects such as bees and butterflies, which facilitate pollination. Failing to plant these indigenous trees can negatively impact the ecosystem and lead to a loss of biodiversity. The vice mayor of Rosizi district in charge of economic affairs, Alfred Habimana, participated in the planting of 300,000 trees in Ubutara and Keyeye. He urged residents to preserve these trees to ensure they yield the desired results. Local authorities, as well as residents in general, what to request from them is to understand that the project is in place to support them so that their soil, which would be affected by erosion, can be sustained by these trees. We urge them to preserve these trees, not by understanding that the trees are for this project, but rather that it is in their best interest so that others may support them. According to the Rwanda Forestry Authority, Plans are underway to plant over 60 million trees across the country. In Rusizi district, efforts are being made to plant these trees in various locations, including fields and riverbanks, to combat erosion that poses a threat to the community.
Thank you, Prince. Now to other matters. The Ministry of Infrastructure has identified insufficient of the budget as a key obstacle to achieving the goal of providing 100% electricity access to the population as it was planned in NST1. This was reiterated at the Africa Energy Expo, a conference that convened energy stakeholders from across Africa and around the world to discuss challenges and solutions for improving electricity access for the African population. Nora Gladys, once more. Several energy groups from Africa and other groups have gathered to find solutions for the lack of energy in various areas of Africa, including rural regions. During this summit, stakeholders from the industry had the opportunity to showcase their products, particularly to the beneficiaries. They explained how they benefit from this exhibition. The, the economic hub of Africa was affected in terms of the capacity, in terms of electricity. So what we're doing is to try to diversify, uh, ensure that we bring as much energy products as possible. And uh, being here is basically to try and attract some of the independent power producers, people that can basically assist us in terms of uh, providing energy. I think the issue of energy are really global and uh, we are here to also mingle with those people that are within the same space as, as, as the city of Johannes or as City Power. We are looking at obviously new technologies which are out there. You can see in terms of the exhibitions here that you've got a lot of companies both from Africa and even outside Asia and so forth that can actually be able to assist in terms of some of the new energy technologies that the city is also um, looking for. Forma markets is one of our main objectives. Uh, we are big in sustainability basically. So we want, um, apart from the energy shows, we have healthcare um, shows, we organize healthcare uh, shows as well. And that's not only uh, enrich, you know, the, um, the environment, but also the, the community, the, the private sectors, and we want to basically link and connect the private and also the government. Honorable Ibrahim Matola, Malawi's Minister of Energy, emphasized the need for African unity in tackling the challenges that hinders the continent's development. Meanwhile, Olivier Kavira, the Minister of State in the Ministry of Infrastructure, highlighted that the country's energy coverage is currently at 80%. As the theme suggests, investment, integration, infrastructure, and the governance to fuel the energy transition, we are here to address the core pillars that will power Africa's energy transformation. One of the greatest challenges and opportunities facing our continent, which is sustainable energy development. Africa holds immense uh, natural wealth, yet we face real challenges in meeting the energy needs of our rapidly growing populations and the dynamic economies. The discussions in this summit will be pivotal as we explore innovative solutions and collaborative approaches to unlock Africa's full energy potential. We are keenly aware of the importance of collaborative action. Africa stands at a pivotal moment in our journey toward universal electrification, and we are increasingly conscious that our success will depend on a united approach. We believe that energy is not merely a commodity, but a catalyst for development, innovation, and social equity. But our progress is only part of the broader picture of African energy aspirations. Energy access is a critical pillar in achieving Africa's vision 2050. Currently, 600 million people in Africa lack access to electricity, 600 million, representing about 43% of Africa's population. And the vast majority of these people live in Sub-Saharan Africa where the electrification rate is especially very, very low. So let this summit be a platform to share the innovative, innovative approaches and scalable solutions that can help achieve universal access and close the equity gap in energy across our continent. This is our opportunity to share insights, challenge assumptions, and forge new partnerships that will define Africa's energy future. Let us use this platform to think boldly about the policies, projects, and investments needed to achieve a thriving, sustainable energy sector in Africa. 
The main topics discussed at the exhibition included developing a resilient policy framework to leverage the African single electricity market, the role of gas to power, infrastructure in facilitating the energy transition, and financing energy access in Africa, among other related issues in the sector. Enora Gladys, RTV News. Now to Ruhango district, residents of this district, which is located in the southern province of Rwanda, outlined that as the district's main city continues to develop, so should it be with the other parts of the district. Prince Manzi with the details. Residents of Ruhango district applaud the district's overturned development. In the clean Ruhango district, good infrastructures like roads and modern houses are in place and people are happy. On the other hand, those living far from the main city of Ruhango district find it otherwise. I always wonder why though some feel like it is highly developed. Here it is different. For instance, look at this road. It is not well. The funds are distributed elsewhere, but here. Varen Sawarurema, the mayor of Ruhango district, addresses citizens' issues on Ruhango's development. Clean Ruhango is mistakenly understood, but it simply goes with a clean mindset, filled with hope, good future, harmony. The second is the activities that goes with such mindset and in all levels. Mayor Habarurema continues by addressing on why there are no towers in Ruhango district. In the master plan of the country, Ruhango is a district specified for agriculture. The cities are to develop on a certain set level. We are innovating to that extent, including hotels, but we are focusing on developing and small agricultural industries. No goals. Ruhango is also an opportunity for investment in religion-based tourism with over 10 places that could generate income if preserved. Welcome back to Matters Making Headlines Globally. Voters in the United States cast ballots Tuesday to choose their next president. Political polls show candidates Donald Trump and Kamala Harris in a close race. Be away with more. Kamala Harris spent the last days of her campaign in the swing state of Michigan, meeting with voters at a Detroit chicken and waffle restaurant and speaking at a local church where she said voters in her Democratic Party, commonly associated with the color blue, are being joined by voters from the Republican Party who are associated with red. I see a nation determined to turn the page on hatred and division and chart a new way forward. As I travel, I see Americans from so-called red states to so-called blue states who are ready to bend the arc of history toward justice. Donald Trump campaigned in the swing state of North Carolina, where he told supporters he's confident of an Election Day win. As we have a big, a beautiful lead. All we have to do, Mike, all we have to do is go out on Tuesday and vote, vote, vote. Trump told supporters that their opponents are already trying to steal this election. They cheat on elections, and you call them on it, and they want to put you in jail. Think about it. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen, but I love it. You know why? Because we've proven something, we've shown something, and we're going to get it fixed, and we got to win this election. At that rally, Trump again suggested violence against political opponents, this time the media. Harris says this election is about more than partisan politics. Who she seek to deepen divisions, sow hate, spread fear, and cause chaos. And I pledge to listen to people who disagree with me. Because, you see, I don't believe people who disagree with me are the enemy. In fact, I'll give them a seat at the table because that's what strong leaders do. More than 75 million Americans have already voted in this election. That's nearly half the total who voted four years ago. 
Public opinion polls show a close race, with the closing New York Times Siena College survey showing voters equally split at 48 percent for both Trump and Harris. Scott Stearns, VOA News. And the story brings us to the end of tonight's bulletin, but before we leave, a reminder of our top stories. Ali Swery Munderi to the Under Secretary General and Special Advisor of the, on the Prevention of Genocide at the United Nations affirms that the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda left no lessons to the international community given killings targeting the Tutsi in the Eastern DRC. The Ministry of Health has reported that among the 49 individuals who have recovered from Marburg virus, some have completed the surveillance program after testing negative for the virus. On the international scene, voters in the United States cast ballots Tuesday to choose their next president. Political polls show candidates Donald Trump and Kamala Harris in a cold race. And this marks the end of tonight's bulletin. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. On behalf of the technical and news production team, we wish you a productive week ahead. Until next time, goodbye.